during the Little Ice Age, while these glaciers are, are retracting, what happened was, is these guys going out there looking at that, were able to see, okay, look, down here at the, at the foothills of the Alps, we see these features. We see these, we see that, for example, the glacier retracts back and a, and a piece of, a chunk of ice gets left, right? Because it, it's re retracting back, it's melting, there may be a piece of ice that breaks away and it's laying there in the glacial till, right? It continues to retract back, the ice melts, and it forms a puddle in this glacial till, you know, because it might actually be embedded in the glacial till, right? Then it melts, and it forms a lake. That's called a kettle lake, right? So they're looking at erratic boulders. They're looking at kettle lakes. They're seeing where meltwater flowed under the glaciers and then discharged right at the snout of the glacier. And where those meltwater tunnels were formed, once the glacier melted back, you could actually see a trace on the land because there's sediment being carried through those tunnels, right, that are at the bottom of the glacier. They're carrying sediment. So when the, the meltwater source, which is up glacier, finally terminates, the sediment gets left. And it, so when the glacier itself is gone, it's left these large, sinuous, elongated tracks on the landscape. Those are called eskers, right? So... Basically, what happened was, as the Little Ice Age glaciers begin to retract, they're out there looking at this stuff. They're looking at the glacial till, they're looking at the moraine, they're looking at the erratic boulders, they're looking at the kettle lakes, they're looking at, the, at, the, at the, all of this evidence, the eskers and so on. And as a result of that, they were able to then look and see that there was that same phenomena reproduced, but in a much larger scale. You see, because now they could look out onto the to the Jura Mountains, and there in the Jura Mountains, they're finding lithologies that are native to the Alps. And they're going, well, geez, that meant that while the Little Ice Age glaciers came down to the foot of the Alps, apparently you had glaciers that came all the way down and crossed a 30 or 40 or 50 mile valley and swallowed up the Jura Mountains, see? It was seeing the effects of the Little Ice Age that gave them the eyes to see the effects of the Big Ice Age. That's my whole point here. That's right. awesome. Right. That's great. Now, I have a second point to make. Here's the second point. The second point is that ordinarily, as the climate warmed out of the, the, the cold of the Little Ice Age between 1800 and 1850, and the ice began to recede, what we see is that it, it, it's a marginal recession. Basically, the snout of the glaciers melt. It's melting back faster than it's being fed from the source. You know, in a glacier, in a living glacier, you've got the zone of accumulation at the top and the zone of ablation at the bottom. And in between, you've got this ice, this living ice moving, flowing like a, a slow moving flow carrying this material down that it collects from the sides of the valleys, from the floor of the valleys. And so, and then if you have two glaciers coming from two different valleys and they meet, right? Now you have what's called in between. You now get this thing, it's called a medial moraine. Or along the sides of the glaciers, you'll have lateral moraine. But the point is, is that watching these glaciers shrink to a, a fraction of their swollen uh, maximum during the Little Ice Age, 150 to 200 years ago, what we saw was basically they receded back from their margins. They melted from their margins, right? Now, when we look at the melting of the late Pleistocene, or I'll say late Wisconsin complex for North America, we do see, of course, marginal recession, but there's something else. We see epicenters of melting, catastrophic melting, that might be 500 miles or more from the margin of the ice sheet. You see what I'm getting at here? Yeah. 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 So that's the problem. We, we, we cannot explain it because the, the geomorphic evidence is not consistent with a simple prolonged marginal recession. There are melting epicenters. And so far, I don't see anybody explaining that. But this is what I've been doing and what Brad and my, myself have been doing is now exploring in the field 
the meltwater patterns and mapping them. And to my knowledge, nobody has really mapped the, the abundant field evidence that shows there are specific points in the vast six to seven million square miles swallowed up by the ice where you had rapid melting. And that melting then moved in several ways. Over the tops of the glaciers, which would be the term is supraglacial, and underneath the glaciers, which had called subglacial. And it's those flows under the glaciers that really require, demand more attention than they've gotten because the theory that, that came out in uh, the 1980s and 1990s by uh, the late geologist John Shaw up in Canada was that they were produced by the drumlins were produced by subglacial floods. The problem was, and this is where the critics attacked his theory, they said the drumlin fields are too vast. The amount of meltwater exceeds any normal process that we know. Therefore, it wasn't floods, like you say. Never mind that they've been try trying to figure out for 150 years to explain drumlins as the direct action of the glaciers themselves on the substrate. Shaw comes along with a much simpler theory and is able to demonstrate in the laboratory and circumstances in the field where you have the precise reproduction of drumlins on a much smaller scale, where you have water flowing under pressure over a deformable substrate, if that makes sense. Good. So his theory, and now he's no longer alive to defend his theory, but he has um, students and people who do, and they're mostly Canadian. I doesn't seem to be a lot of American geologists that are really willing to take Shaw's theory seriously. But again, the primary objection is that, well, and this is very much like the objection levied at J. Harlan Bretz back in the 20s and the 30s. Well, you're saying there's all of this evidence out in the field for these catastrophic floods, but you can't provide a source for that much water. Therefore, there was no catastrophic floods. And that was the mindset that prevailed literally up until the 1960s. So, um, and it's kind of parallel in a way with John Shaw. The idea is, well, you can't explain the source of so much water because the drumlin fields are huge. They're vast, right? So since you don't have a source for the water, it wasn't floods. Yeah. And my disappointment when we found out that we were actually trying to plan a trip and John Shaw was going to join us with George Howard. We were going to look at uh, Lake Nipigon up there. But then, and yeah, when, when uh, George first contacted him about joining us, he said he would be delighted to join us. And then, ironically, he passed away very shortly after that. So that was a big disappointment to me. Um, but he has students who are carrying on his work, like Jerome Lessman who was a co-author of a seminal paper that they wrote that came out in 2000. Um, and Brad and I had the, uh, the opportunity to spend four days in the field with Jerome, what, three or four years ago. So we were up in the, the British Columbia Drumlin Swarm and, um, yeah, came away from that totally convinced that, yeah, we are looking at catastrophic subglacial flows. And there's, that's the only way to explain these things. But right. again, the, 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 the Achilles heel is that, Wait a second, the volumes of water you're talking about are so enormous that, no, that couldn't be. We have no, there's no way to explain that much, that massive volume of water. So, therefore, the subglacial flood theory is out the window. Yeah, yeah that was 2017, so that was over two years ago. Over two Sorry, years Cal. ago, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, and he, he took us to several places that he thought was critical and those were places that we had already gone ourselves because we, we determined yeah. that this is something that we definitely had to see. And, uh, yeah, those same places he went to us. So that was, I was thinking that, that big gorge we went to, yeah. uh, I can't recall the, the name of it, but it was something like that. Just the, the gorge or something, yeah. that, you know, so unexpected right there in central Southern British Columbia, uh, had to be massive subglacial melt water flows. Yeah. Yeah. And then Brad, the drumming Brad, fields are just farther South of that. Yeah. Right. So what Brad was just saying, you know, we, we had gone already gone up there years before 
had explored a number of these sites that we thought were critical to this idea, supported this idea. So then when we finally, we get out in the field with, with Jerome, he ends up taking us to several of those same sites. Well, yeah, we know we've been here before. We saw this. We we figured out on our own that this was, you know, probably significant. 